I'm here to tell you that Yellowstone is not America's first national park. On paper, sure. In name, yeah. But in idea, no. The idea behind Yellowstone, that radical idea holding up every national park in America today, that was not born in Yellowstone. Yellowstone was the culmination of an experiment started eight years earlier in another of our premier national parks. It was an experiment born in hardship. There was a time when the future of national parks, before Yellowstone, before the National Park Service even, was in doubt. When even the idea of a national park could have been killed before it even got off the ground. Lucky for us, that didn't happen. And it's all thanks to one park. The park where all of this took place, where the idea of a national park was born. Yosemite. My name is Cameron. Welcome to National Park Diaries. This is a channel dedicated to telling stories about national parks, public lands, and protected areas around the world. They're fun, engaging, educational stories covering a whole host of topics from biology to geology to natural history and everything in between, all having to do with parks. If that sounds like something you are interested in, then maybe consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the little bell thing so you don't miss an episode. I also have a Patreon. National Park Diaries is entirely fan funded and literally this entire operation would not be possible without your support. I run a book club over there, I do AMAs and behind the scenes videos, I have a discord and my wife even writes poetry. It's a great time and you can check it out at patreon.com slash National Park Diaries. Now, this episode is brought to you by Missing Shoe Films and Sunil Jadav8381, who requested this topic on another video I made about the insanity that was the old Yosemite firefall. If you have any topics you would like to see covered, viewer suggestions are always welcome in the comments. And I don't know if when they requested this topic that Missing Shu and Sunil knew the importance of the story they were requesting here. Because as I mentioned, the idea of national parks didn't really start with Yellowstone. Of course, like on paper, yes, Yellowstone was the first, but I think it's the idea the intent, the collective national mindset that led to the creation of national parks that's really the most important. And that idea was born in Yosemite, not Yellowstone. Now, today we take the idea of our national parks as a given. I mean, they're referred to as America's best idea. They've been here for over a hundred years and contain some of the most beloved destinations in America. and probably even the world. People love them. They flock to them by the millions each year. They're a mainstay of America and American culture, and it's unfathomable to think of this country without them. But our modern view of national parks can cloud the early realities this system faced, and it can be easy to lose sight of just how precariously positioned they were back when this idea was first put to the test. The truth is, without a few key inflection points in the history of Yosemite, national parks as we know them today might not exist at all. So let me take you back to the Yosemite Valley in the mid 1800s. For thousands of years, this area had been occupied by a Miwok speaking people known as the Awanichi, who took their name from their own word for Yosemite Valley, Awani which meant place of a gaping mouth. Yosemite Valley, or Awani, was their home, and they lived in and depended on the valley for their survival. They used fire to modify the valley floor to make it easier to harvest acorns and hunt wild game. In a devastating yet familiar series of events though, the Awanichi population was decimated through disease and forced removal, leaving the Yosemite Valley under the control of white settlers and the US government. And for a while, its rugged terrain and isolation meant very few people had ever even heard of Yosemite, much less visited it. It was the domain of prospectors and frontiersmen hoping to strike it rich in the heart of the Sierras. Eventually though, word began to spread about this incomparable geologic wonder. It gained local, then regional, and finally national attention. 
Publishers from around the United States came to see Yosemite before singing its praises to their broader audience. They spoke of towering mountains, bucolic valleys, gargantuan trees, and scenery unmatched anywhere else in the world. Some publishers even spoke of Yosemite in terms of cathedrals and ancient antiquities, comparing this great natural wonder of America with the cultural wonders of Europe. This was an important first step in the national park ideal. The very first inklings of conservation were worming their way into the American consciousness. We were beginning to tie our cultural identity as a nation with our natural wonders. Sure, Europe had its Roman ruins and Gothic cathedrals and storied history, but America? We had Yosemite. The linking of Yosemite with America's cultural identity was critical to fostering a sense of collective national responsibility for Yosemite. The idea that this place belonged to America and that Americans had a collective responsibility to protect it. I mean, we wouldn't let our cathedrals and ancient antiquities, if we had them, be destroyed, so why would Yellowstone be any different? It deserved protection too. With that mindset in place, this sort of cultural and intellectual shift in the broader public thinking, the foundation was laid for actual preservation efforts to take place. Because as we know, along with popularity comes economic opportunity and people who would take advantage of beautiful natural places for profit. Take for example Niagara Falls, another incomparable scenic wonder which had already fallen victim to over commercialization and development. This played on the minds of those who wanted to see Yosemite protected. They did not want it to become another Niagara Falls. And the only way to stop it was to prevent Yosemite from private development. Prevent the homesteaders and shopkeepers and factory owners and souvenir sellers from setting up shop in the valley and despoiling the natural beauty of Yosemite, it would have to be made into a public park. And that's exactly what happened. On June 30th, 1864, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Yosemite Act into law. Now, this is a crucial part of the story, so let me take some time here to explain the significance of what's going on. When Congress passed the Yosemite Act, they did not create a national park under federal control and management like we think of today. It was federal land, but what they had done was grant that land, both Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Big Tree Grove, to the state of California under the condition that the land be used for, quote, public use, resort, and recreation, end quote, and that it shall, quote, be inalienable for all time, end quote. This may not have been a national park on paper, but that's really just a semantic argument. Let's zoom out here and take a look at what Congress was really doing when they signed the Yosemite Act. They were taking a piece of public land, federally owned land, removing it from any sort of private development, no homesteading, no logging, no mining, and saying it could be used for nothing except public use, resort, and recreation. In short, they set it aside exclusively for the benefit of the public, for you and me. That's it. That's the national park idea. This is exactly what national parks are today. They are places we, as a society, have said, this is for everyone to enjoy. No fancy subdivisions, no factories, no logging, none of that. People can come here and simply enjoy the beautiful natural places this country has to offer, and we're going to set them aside and protect them forever so that anyone can do that. That mentality, that idea that underpins the entire national park system today, was born that day at Yosemite in 1864. But such a radical idea was not to go unchallenged. About six weeks before the Yosemite Act was passed, a guy by the name of James Hutchings had come to the Yosemite Valley intending to file a homestead claim. Now, Hutchings had been hanging around near Yosemite for a while. He was actually one of those people singing its praises in the press, drawing attention to its wonders and encouraging people to visit. But now, he wanted to settle there. He saw the publicity that Yosemite was getting, which he helped generate, and intended to capitalize on it by operating a hotel in the valley. Only he had a problem. Yosemite Valley was unsurveyed, meaning the federal government had yet to formally like organize the land and open it for settlement. So technically, 
Hutchings's claim was illegal. And when the Yosemite Act was passed, transferring this land to California for public use, resort, and recreation, Hutchings's claim was in direct opposition to that proto-national park idea. Private settlement and public use were completely incompatible with the new Yosemite Park, because if one guy could settle there, anyone could. And if anyone could, this opened up the entire valley and thus the new national park idea to private exploitation, which would, of course, threaten that idea itself. So the newly formed Yosemite Board of Commissioners, who oversaw management of the park for the state, had a problem. At first, they offered Hutchings a lease for the land, as was allowable under the Yosemite Act. But Hutchings didn't budge. He claimed he owned the land and wasn't taking no for an answer. So the board sued him because, again, you can't have a private settler in your newly formed public park. Now, Hutchings tried to circumvent the legal battle by going directly to the California state legislature. He made the argument that he was just a lowly homesteader trying to eke out a living on the rugged American frontier. This worked. His argument hit a chord with the California legislature, and they passed a law granting Hutchings his claim in Yosemite Valley. But they put this condition in the law that says it had to get approved by Congress first, because Congress had granted the land to California in the first place. So Hutchings goes to Congress and again plays his lowly homesteader card. The House of Representatives is sympathetic. They passed a bill to grant him his claim, but the Senate isn't having any of it. They shut him down and sent him packing back to California, where the courts would decide his fate. Now, let's pause here and consider the significance of what Congress just did again. They had passed the Yosemite Act back in 1864, which, as we've talked about, contained within it the very beginnings, the kernel of this new national park idea. Now, here before them in 1868, was the first test of the idea they had first put forth four years earlier. If they had legitimized Hutchings' claim, they would have undermined that very idea, the one they had so radically enacted back in 1864. But by repudiating his claim, they had once again validated the idea. They had doubled down on the national park idea, further legitimized it, even when given the chance to change their minds. Now, back on the legal battlefield, Hutchings' case went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. Here was yet another hurdle for the national parks to clear. The stakes, though, were the same. Before the court was the question of whether or not Congress had the power to remove lands from the public domain for purposes other than settlement, in this case, for a public park. If the court legitimized Hutchings' claim, national parks were in jeopardy. This would have severely hampered Congress's ability to set aside federal land as a public park, which is, of course, how all national parks are created, how Yosemite was created, how the whole idea of national parks got started. If they struck it down, though, the idea lived on, further bolstering its legitimacy and further empowering Congress to set aside federal land for the enjoyment and benefit of the public, to set aside national parks. Also, by this time, Yellowstone had just been created nine months earlier, so its fate hung in the balance as well, since it was another piece of federal land set aside for the purposes of public recreation. The court sided with Yosemite and with national parks. The idea born in Yosemite eight long years prior had cleared its final hurdle. The legitimacy of the national park idea was fully realized and now extends to 62 other national parks, Yellowstone included, and more than 420 units of the national park system overall. Now, it's important to remember that we are viewing this with the benefit of hindsight. Nobody back then was debating these things or framing them as a titanic battle for the soul of national parks in America. But looking back, it's pretty clear that that's exactly what this was. Had Hutchings' claim been legitimized, the foundation of our national park system today, that we set aside pieces of public land for the benefit and enjoyment of the public, free from private settlement, would have been threatened. 
Yosemite could become another Niagara Falls, and the power of Congress to create national parks might never have been realized. It teetered on the edge there for a few years. The fate of the national parks hung in the balance. But in the end, we got there. We have national parks, and we have Yosemite to thank for that. That's why Yosemite is the first national park in America. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, let me know your thoughts on Yosemite down below. Were you aware of its story or of its importance to the national park system? Have you been there? Does knowing its importance change the context of your visit? I always find things like this just radically change my relationship with certain parks, and I love to hear your thoughts. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Instagram at National Park Diaries. It's the easiest place to get in touch with me and stay up to date with the latest channel developments. Uh, check out my Patreon and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.